There is, however, another early book which adds hugely to our knowledge of Shakespeare and of which you may have heard, the first folio. So far I've talked about quartos, the small single editions of Shakespeare's plays that began to be published during his lifetime. The last book I want to talk about is a much bigger book and one of the most famous and valuable books in the world, the first folio. Uh, this again is a facsimile or reproduction. Uh, if it was an original, it would be worth millions and millions of pounds. This book is a collected edition of Shakespeare's plays. The term folio, like the term quarto, refers to the size of the book, to the number of times a sheet of paper was folded to make the book, in this case, once. As you can see, a folio is a large book, and it would have been very expensive to buy. This book is called the first folio, because it was the first time that Shakespeare's plays had been published together. It was printed in 1623, seven years after Shakespeare's death. Uh, and here you can see the very famous title page with this image of Shakespeare. This book is especially interesting in terms of what it tells us about how Shakespeare was regarded by his contemporaries. The very fact that all of Shakespeare's plays were published together in such an expensive, prestigious format, with Shakespeare's name and image given such prominence, suggests how early Shakespeare had something of what we might term celebrity status. Okay. But this book is also interesting in terms of what we've been seeing is the complex relationship between what Shakespeare first wrote and what ended up in print. In some cases, the plays printed in the folio had never been printed before and wouldn't otherwise survive. Macbeth is an example of a play in that category. In all other cases, the plays printed in the folio had already been printed in the quarto format we were considering earlier. So what we can do in those cases is to compare the early quartos and the later folio edition. And when, what we find when we do this is all kinds of differences. Let's take King Lear as an example. The version of this play printed in quarto in 1608 has the title The History of King Lear. The version that appears in the folio is called The Tragedy of King Lear. There are significant differences between the two versions, but it's not simply the case that one text is more reliable or polished than the other. Both seem to be coherent, complete texts. They're just different. Let's briefly take one example of a passage that differs suggestively. At this point in the play, the old Earl of Gloucester, a loyal follower of King Lear, has just been punished for that loyalty by Lear's daughter, Regan, and her husband, Cornwall. In one of the most horrific moments of stage violence in all of Shakespeare, Cornwall plucks out Gloucester's eyes. Here's how the scene ends in the earlier quarto edition of the play. Gloucester is cast out onto the heath to fend for himself, to suffer, perhaps to die. Regan says, go thrust him out at gates, and Cornwall agrees, saying, turn out that eyeless villain. But some of Cornwall's servants feel sorry for Gloucester and decide to try to help him. The first servant in the penultimate speech in the extract says, let's follow the old earl. And the second servant agrees, saying, I'll fetch some flax and whites of eggs to apply to his bleeding face. Now heaven help him. And the two servants exit, ending the scene. So, as brutal as this scene has been, it ends with a glimmer of humanity. The servants' actions keep alive the possibility of compassion in the brutal and divided world of the play. In this way, they perhaps provide comfort not only for Gloucester, but also for the audience. Now let's look at how the scene ends in the later folio version. You can see straight away that the servant's lines are cut. Gloucester is simply cast out with the same lines from Regan and Cornwall 
Regan says, go thrust him out at gates. Cornwall, turn out that eyeless villain. And no one follows him. The scene just ends and the next begins. There is no glimmer of humanity, no hope. Nothing alleviates, or we might say dilutes, the cruelty of this episode. So, both versions make sense. Both work on stage. We can't simply say that one version is better than the other. How can we explain the differences? What we might be getting a rare opportunity to see is Shakespeare revising his own works. He may have revised the earlier quarto version to produce the version that then ends up in the folio. If so, then what's especially striking is that the, many of the changes he makes, as with the scene we've just been looking at, make the play even more bleak and pessimistic. What we've seen then is a complicated, interesting and messy picture. Some of the early printed texts of Shakespeare's plays not only include what we might think of as mistakes, but also differ in ways that don't seem to be accidental and that give us unique insights into Shakespeare's practice as a writer. How can we make sense out of this picture? And what does it mean for us as modern readers of Shakespeare? The quarto and folio editions of Shakespeare's plays are the only witnesses we have to what Shakespeare wrote. Any modern edition will be based on these early editions. Now, I'm sure it'll be clear from everything that I've said that editors of these modern editions have a lot of work to do. They can't simply find a copy of an early edition of a play in a library and transcribe it. First, they have to compare different editions and different copies of those editions and choose which to follow. They might decide to follow one early edition or to combine elements of more than one. And in either case, they might have to select variants from different copies and correct any apparent mistakes. Second, modern editors of Shakespeare's plays usually choose to modernize spelling and punctuation, which, as we've seen, is very different in the early editions. Third, modern editors usually add stage directions. There are very few stage directions in the early editions, but the texts themselves give us clues as to what's happening on stage. Modern editors translate those clues into additional stage directions. All of this work aims to make Shakespeare's plays more accessible for the modern reader, but it also involves the editor's own subjective judgments about what is and isn't authentically Shakespearean about what does and doesn't fit, about what will work on stage and on the page. Let's look at one last passage so as to see an example of this kind of editorial work. What we have here is a short extract from the ending of Romeo and Juliet. First, from the 1599 quarto edition, and second, from a modern edition. Looking at the early quarto edition, first of all, we can see that there's only one stage direction, enter boy and watch. This is the moment at which Juliet kills herself, but it's actually quite difficult to work out from this early edition exactly what's happening on stage. We're not sure exactly what Juliet's doing, nor what the relationship is between Juliet and the other two characters, the boy and the watchman. Juliet seems to be alone, saying, Yea, noise, then I'll be brief. But the boy and the watchman also seem to be present. Well, now let's look at the modern edition to see how the editor has clarified what's going on at this moment in the play. First of all, the editor has added stage directions to clarify Juliet's actions. The point at which she takes Romeo's dagger the point at which she stabs herself, and the point at which she dies. Notice that all of those editorial additions are in square brackets. 
Anytime you see square brackets in a modern edition, that indicates that what you're seeing is an editorial edition. So these added stage directions make sense of Juliet's actions. The editor also makes two interventions which clarify the relationship between Juliet and the other two characters, the boy and the watchman. First of all, he adds the word within to the watchman's first line, indicating that the watchman is approaching but is not yet on stage. Second, the editor moves down the original stage direction, enter boy and watch, to a point immediately after Juliet's death. This makes sense of Juliet's lines, yea noise, then I'll be brief. She is alone, but she knows someone is approaching. This staging wasn't clear in the early text, but the editor has decided that this is what was intended and clarified it for the reader. You can see that the editor has also modernised all of the spelling and the punctuation. So you can see that editors play an important part in shaping our experience of Shakespeare's plays. This work of editors is informed by ongoing research into Shakespeare's practice as a writer, theatre history, print history, and so on. And this is why we need to keep re-editing Shakespeare's works why an edition published, say, in the early 20th century might now seem out of date. What then are the implications of all of this for the A-level or prospective undergraduate student of Shakespeare? First, it's really important and will be increasingly important if you study Shakespeare at university to use good editions, editions in which the editorial work is reliable and up-to-date Series such as the New Cambridge, Oxford, Arden are all very reliable. Second, it's a good idea to find out about the edition you're using, to read the introduction and notes, to find out what early texts is it based on, what editorial procedures have been adopted, and so on. Third, it's also worth comparing different editions. As we saw with the King Lear example, relatively minor cuts, additions and changes can really change the feel of the play and change the way we interpret it. Fourth, and more generally, thinking about Shakespeare's texts reminds us of the importance of always paying close attention to textual detail. Altogether then, the better you understand the additions you use and the processes through which they've been produced, the better you understand Shakespeare. And the better able you are to appreciate just how amazing it is that Shakespeare's works survive in all of their richness and subtlety.